Hello, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Stephen Hodgson, and I'm the head of publishing at AMEB. I'm very, very happy to be here today to announce the beginning of our online orchestra project for 2021. As some of you will know, we held our first online orchestra project in 2018 as part of AMEB's centenary celebrations. The first song the orchestra performed was Waltzing Matilda. And the project was so successful and we received so many amazing entries and wonderful feedback that we decided to do it again in the following year, 2019. Last year, we chose Bruce Woodley and Dove Newton's song, I Am Australian. For those who don't know, the AMEB Online Orchestra invites people from all over Australia to contribute a recording of themselves playing or singing the chosen song. We then weave all of these together into a massive final video. Of course, we've all seen a million of these in recent times during the pandemic. And I think it's, evidence, uh, it's evident what a rewarding experience it is for both those participating and those watching. We recently decided to make the online orchestra a biannual event occurring every other year. This will allow us to spend more time planning the project and choosing the right song. For the past two years, we have selected well-known and well-loved songs with a particular connection to Australia. This year, we have something very, very special, an entirely new song based on a story that has been told in this country for at least seven generations. We are extremely excited and feel very privileged to be sharing with you this song commissioned especially for the 2021 AMEB Online Orchestra Project. AMEB has had a close association with the Uganda Youth Choir for a number of years and with their director, Candace Kruger. Some of you may have seen the choir performing in both our previous online orchestra videos, last year singing in language during the first verse of I Am Australian. So for this year, we decided to ask Candace if she knew of an indigenous song that might be suitable for our online orchestra project. From that discussion came the idea of AMEB commissioning a new song and the result is Morning Star and Evening Star. The lyrics are adapted by Candace from a narrative handed down to her by her great aunt, Lottie Eaton, with new music written by Candace, her cousin, Lan Lavinge, and daughter, Isabella Kruger. The song is fantastic and we hope students, parents, teachers, bands, choirs, and orchestras all around Australia will fall in love with it and perform it with us next year. So that you can all get to know the song, Candice and Lan have produced a version of the song performed by the Ugumba Youth Choir and also a music video. So before I introduce Candice to tell us more about the origins of the song, we'd like to play the music video for you. So here it is the AMEB Online Orchestra 2021 song, Morning Star and Evening Star by Candace Kruger, Lan LeVinge and Isabella Kruger. The only uh, one that I can remember that I don't know the words of it, but Granny used to sing to me every night about the morning star and the evening star. I used to uh, go to the stage with my grandmother at her house when I was in school, and uh, she used to sing this story about the morning and evening star, uh, which would be the one big one and the other one in the back one. Well, it didn't call out to the other one. So I'd say, no, you go ahead. And 
Oh, what a spectacular video. Um, joining us now is Candace Kruger, who was a, a big contributor to writing the song, wrote the melody and adapted all of the lyrics. Hi, Candace, and thank you so much for joining us today. Fingery, Steve, thank you for having us. I um, I just watched that again, and I'm just so thrilled for all of the kids and community that participated, and also for Lan and Isabella in contributing to putting this song together. Such, a, such an amazing project. And there's so much embedded into this song uh, that online orchestra participants can sink their teeth into. Uh, but to start with the in original inspiration, can you tell us about the lyrics and narrative that you used in Morning Star and Evening Star? Yes, so um, in, in the late 90s, 1990s, um, my grandfather, Sam Levinge, was encouraging me to collect stories and narratives of our community. And I was all of 22, 23 years old and had just finished a music degree. And at the time, he said, my sister knows a song, so we need to go and visit Lottie. And I've known Lottie my whole life and I was really comfortable going and talking to Lottie. So um, my husband, my grandfather and myself went down to visit Lottie in Ballina. And in 1996, um, Lottie told me about the Morning Star and the Evening Star and she, she said it was a, a song that was sung to her by her grandmother which is Jenny Graham and um, which would have been passed to her by her mother Waru so you know seven generations of this or over seven generations of this song being passed along and I know that Lottie also told it to other family members I know that Lan had heard it as well but she said to me at that point in time I'd really like this song to come alive again it needs to be shared with other people i can remember that it was sung she remembered that it was sung to her in language um, but she couldn't remember the melody anymore and she couldn't remember the language but she could remember exactly what it meant in english and i'm just going to read you exactly what she said morning star and evening star who is the fat one and who is the thin one morning star and evening star who should come out first Morning star calls to evening star, come on. Evening star sings out, no, you go ahead. And so that was the information that we had and that was where we began this narrative. And really telling a story about the first star you see at night and the first or oh, the last star that you see in the morning. Yes, so what was really important here was to actually begin to do some ecological knowledge research. And I had to actually uncover and speak to elders. I've spoken to um, nine, nine elders across the Yubinbeh region have blessed this song. They are so thrilled that this is happening. And what we did and what I did was went out and spoke to them and talked about, were we talking about a planet or were we talking about two different stars in a conversation? And so it was revealed over time as I've been investigating this song for a good year and a half now. And it was really revealed that we were actually specifically talking about the morning star, um, Mulligan, and Wagan, the crow star, the evening star. So that two stars are having a conversation in the sky. And I was able to actually find other parts of the narrative as well. You can see that Kaguru, the kookaburra is in there. And when I put the lyrics together, what I wanted to reflect was the fact that it was actually Lottie's story and how she, what the information she had told us. So for example, you know, many years she sings of her country. We were actually talking about Jenny Graham and the ancestors before her passing along this song line in little ears singing this story about the two stars in the sky having a conversation. So what was really important was also to share part of the narrative of Lottie's journey of knowing this song and then also how it was passed down to her all within the song lyrics. It's, it's wonderful. It's, it's so rich in, in story and so rich in ideas. Um, you, you can hear various words in language in the song. Um, can you tell us a little bit about Yugambe and, and tell us what some of those words mean? Yes, so Yugambe language region is of, we know it as the Gold Coast Logan and City Council, uh, sorry, Gold Coast Scenic Rim and Logan City Council regions. And really we're talking about the Logan River of Southeast Queensland down to the Tweed River and out to Bow Desert. So Yugambe language region. And there are many um, family um, community Aboriginal groups on there as well. So I'm Kumba Mary and Nugi, Kumba Mary of Southport Narang and across the traditional marriage line of Nugi of Morton Island. And there are um, all the way out to the Mananjali people of Bow Desert. And so the many um, family tribal groups. And so what we're talking about here is using their language. And so we've got word, the word for um, 
Mulligan, which is morning star, and we have the word for wagan, which is crow star. But also, I've challenged you in this to actually sing an entire two lines in Yugambeh language as well. So when we sing um, kookaburra, I haven't put the word kookaburra into the song. I've put kaguru, which is the word for kookaburra in Yugambeh language, and jagun, which is the land, the, the ground that we stand on, our country. So what I've done in this song is mixed Yugambeh language words in and not giving you the English translation. It's really up to the audience to begin to learn and speak in Yugambeh language. And it's not too difficult. We've dropped it in in very subtle places so that it can be learnt quite easily. And reinforced by repetitions of, of words in, in English yeah. and both uh, in English and Yugambeh. How do you feel about people around Australia singing in Yugambeh? I'm really, really excited. I've been talking to a number of music teachers and, and educators lately, and they're just really, really excited to be picking up um, a piece that they can understand the narrative and understand where it's from, and also the fact that there's, there's knowledge behind it and what the knowledge of the land and the land, sea, sky is for this region. Um, and it really demonstrates a way to move forward to um, help people learn Aboriginal knowledges. Yeah, I, it's it's just such a powerful way of passing on knowledge, and I know that that goes right to the heart of of your views on music and and um, where you see music as having a function. And um, it was really important to us at AMEB that that we honour uh, the, the the cultural passing along of knowledge and gain permission uh, from your community elders to use this narrative. And um, we're really grateful for you help for your help. Um, facilitating this. Last year, our CEO, Bernard Depasquale, uh, head of examining Fiona Sears and myself, travelled up to North Stradbroke Island, and we were very lucky to meet your father, Ian Lavinge, as well as elders Ray Lavinge and Rose Knott, to discuss the project and sign a permissions document. Um, it was a it was a fantastic day and, and such a privilege. Um, can you tell us why this was so important for you and your community? Part of it was about you stepping onto country and about your understanding um, the, the land and the people and the information that we were going to share and pass along, you know, and it was a, a wonderful morning tea. Um, I'm just going to correct you there. It was not Ray, it was Ivan. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. That's all right. <laughs> so we, and it's fine. So we, we sat down with, um, and uh, just Previous to you being there, Ida has also sat down with other relatives on my parents' back veranda as well on Stradbroke Island to have these conversations and for you to understand, for Amy B to understand that the sharing of this knowledge is valuable and important and um, it's the land's narrative. You know, it's there are people that were here before me and I'm here now and there will be people here after me. And what we're sharing is a narrative that can be continued to be passed along. And the elders are thrilled that this song is being sung alive again. And it's a way of telling um, people about the two stars that are in the sky, the ones that wake you up in the morning when the spirits of the kookaburra sing and they, they wake you up and then the kookaburras also sing you to bed at night and they're waking the spirits in the sky and these are the morning star and evening star that guide you. And considering that we're saltwater people and we're connected to the waterways and to the land and the Levinge family are well-known oyster oystering family as well. And we understand um, the, the seaways and the way of life even even I do, um, because I was taught that as a child as well. And so what's really important by Amy B coming and meeting elders is that you began to have an understanding of what that all meant. And within our documents, what you'll see is also permissions and protocols from elders as well. Yeah, look, we absolutely honour um, what an amazing gift it is to, to have that narrative pass along to us in this form. Um, and I love that 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 salt water and, and sea plays such a big role in the, the video that we saw, just saw. Um, in the video is, is your wonderful choir, the Yugambo Youth Choir. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the choir? Um, so the Yugambo Youth Choir was founded. I had an idea that I wanted to, to see if any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children wanted to join me on Yugambo country and actually learn some of the songs and the narratives of our land. And of course, in 2015, 2014, 2015, I had um, young people that came along and joined me on that journey. And I decided that it wasn't about um, 
exclusivity, it was really about inclusivity. Any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander child that lives on Yugan Bear country that wanted to learn and the moment that they step into prep at school, so age five, four to five, and all the way up to really 25, we haven't got anyone that's 25 yet, um, but we will within the next year or two. And, and then, you know, then you've really learnt that um, role of leadership and you get that connection of well-being and identity and Aboriginality and you also get to learn about your culture. And so the Yugambeh Youth Choir um, has taken a hit from COVID, of course. We didn't have everybody in the video, which is why it was really important to put some of the rehearsal um, in there as well. So we've only had a couple of rehearsals to be able to prepare this, which has been a little bit difficult. Um, but, you know, over the last number of years, we've worked i've worked with 60 families and children and jajam and it's just been really amazing and then i watch those same kids go out to their schools and share the songs and the narrative of what we've been learning so i know that the morning star and evening star is going into multiple schools in southeast queensland because these kids can't wait to take it to their school and to their teacher and and start talking about this narrative of their land and so so the choir is is very much at the heart of, of keeping language alive um, and how do you rehearse? What what happens in a typical rehearsal? So um, rehearsals are on Friday afternoons and coming soon also on Wednesday afternoons. Um, I need to be in two places. So I volunteer my time as a community volunteer and as a music educator. And um, I'm really grateful to the Queensland Academies of Health Science on the Gold Coast because they've been able to gift us the use of their auditorium for the last six years. And we rehearse on a Friday afternoon um, and everyone comes in and except for COVID, lots of hugs and lots of how's your week been and what have you been up to and lots of conversations about English and math and science and everything that's going on at school and, and um, you know, proudly ribbon wearing because somebody's won a race at a sports carnival. And we just, um, it's not a typical choir at all. So we certainly do do vocal warm ups. And um, recently, this in the last few weeks, I've shared some free You Can Bear vocal warm ups with community, and Amy B will also share that as well. And um, in You Can Bear language, of course. And then we sing and um, when we sing, we, everybody tries different harmony parts, and a fair bit of it for a long time has all been. Oral. So actually hearing, listening, connecting the words. And then we began to write songs down and actually put them onto um, score on the page. And that was the moment that I began to see over the last two years um, children being able to read and recognise using their words and make connections between songs because they were actually reading a language rather than just hearing it orally. So it's certainly interesting. And we hop up and we clap and stamp and we... Um, play boomerang beats and um, do actions to help us learn words. You know, even if we're just doing, singing something that's yan balayla, going walking, we're doing that action as well. Just things that help us connect to the songs. And, you know, when I first started um, choir, I had only a handful of songs and within two years, the choir members and the children were saying, well, can we have some more? What <laughs> else have we got? So that really made me go on that journey of um, what can I find? What narratives are out there that have been songs? What song lines need to be told and how can we continue this along? So, and that's what the Morning Star and Evening Star is, a next and new song line, which is an old song and an old song line, but sung alive again for everyone to learn. It's, it's really spectacular. Um, I'd, I'd love to learn a little bit about how the songwriting process uh, unfolded. I, I know there were two other contributors to the writing of, the, of this song. Um, could you walk us through a little bit how that, that all happened? Um, I guess it was a little difficult because we knew that we were writing for the online orchestra program and that we would have some parameters around that for students for easily trans posing instruments and for um, students to be able to play, but we also wanted some freedom to be able to do it. And the other hard part was that we needed to do the lyrics first, that it really needed to be a poem that paid homage and respect to the story, to the information that Lottie had passed on as well. So that was what was first. And then the considerations, of course, of um, whatever music knowledge that we needed to, to work in there with the score. And then um, Lan, my cousin Lan and I had a conversation about how we would do this and and that um, he would, I gave him the poem and he had, he would come up with a few ideas and then I would um, come up with a few ideas. And then it jumped forward to my daughter, Isabella, um, uh, said, oh, what are you working on? And, and she knew what I was doing, but I said, I'm actually writing the melody now. And with a pouring 
um, rainy night here on the Gold Coast and we just moved into a new house and the piano was in the garage. So we actually went out to the garage in a rainstorm and um, Bella and I worked on uh, a melody, a melodic line and um, Bella was singing harmonies and we were just having a really, really great time. And then the next day we took our ideas to Lan. Lan had his ideas and it was just right. Everything just fit together really beautifully. We'd worked on the same sort of chords, chord progression. We had, um, Lan had some really great ideas for the chorus that worked so beautifully. And we had a lot of um, melodic parts for the for the verses and um, really for the bridge. So just Lan's, Isabella's and my own ideas just melded to this song. It was really just meant to be. And that's how it moved forward. Well, that's extremely exciting and, and an amazing process. I think this is probably a good time to bring Lan into the conversation, given um, given where we've gotten to. Um, so I'd like to introduce Lan Levinch, who helped write uh, Morning Star and Evening Star. Lan is a professional musician, recording artist, videographer, and music producer. And you're also Candace's cousin. Uh, so Lottie was your great aunt as well. Yeah, hey. Um... Lottie was more like a grandmother to me, but um, yeah, biologically a, a great aunt. Um, Jingri, Lan, by the way, uh, everybody out there. And I just want to say thank you to AMEB for inviting me to be part of this and with Candace inviting me into it as well. It's been a great experience for me and the family. And um, yeah, we're just super excited about it. And such a relief to see it up and out and doing its thing, Thank many you. late nights, oh. many early mornings, uh, lots of tears. It's been <laughs> been fantastic, and uh, the results great. And it's been it's been awesome working with Candice and Bella on this, and and yourself and, and Fiona. And it's just it's awesome. So well, can't thank you so much. It's it's so it's so fun. happy. And and what you've contributed with the, the whole orchestration of everything, which we've listened to, you know, like a thousand times. It's um. <laughs> It's really good. I can't wait to hear the kids play it. Well, look, we'll get more onto the orchestra later on, but um, thank you so much. It's been a, an absolute pleasure putting this all together with you both and with Isabella. Um, could you walk us through your your first involvement with the songwriting process, how how that all took shape? Yeah, I guess, like, like Candy said, it was a case of the, the lyrics were kind of there from Lottie and adapted. And then it was sitting down, running through, running through chord structures, figuring out melody lines that I thought would work, and then coming together with Candice and Bella and, and putting that, that melody together and adding, adding pieces in that fit with the words without losing too much of the lyrical content. Mm. We had to strip a few things back and change things, but we um, tried to keep as much of, as what Candice had lyrically put there which is why I developed that little sort of section at the end of the chorus that sort of that build that sort of climb to, to fit in but I, th I think it just works oh absolutely we, we particularly love the the kagaru or the kookaburra section absolutely. in the middle yeah. the, the dance yeah. section with the, the drum break yeah. Uh, yeah. and that inspired a, a whole percussion uh, mm. involvement that we haven't had so far um, yeah. and you both worked on that that idea who who's uh... yeah yeah it was i think we were in the studio um and we were sort of running through things and there might have been a melody line that was going with the the calgary part but then we we sort of decided that that was probably a good opportunity to strip it back and have that sort of drone kind of feel that that typical kind of traditional kind of feel of an, an aboriginal song and mm. bring that really into it which i think works so well um, so I had a lot of drums and stuff going on initially, but I pulled all that back and just in the end it was it was sticks and clapping and stamping feet and it just worked. It, it, it works so beautifully. Um, uh, you're, you're responsible for filming and editing the, uh, editing the music video as well, of course. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, <laughs> <tell> us, <laughs> uh, can you tell us a little bit about where you filmed the choir? Yeah, so we did, um, we did summit rehearsal. So I threw a little bit of that in, um, but the majority was down at Phillip Park, down across from SeaWorld um, at the Spit at Main Beach. So yeah. it's, just a, it's, it's kind of like one of my go-to spots 
Um, I know where the sun sort of sits in the cloud structure in the mornings. Um, I did some filming. So we, we tried to do a, a Friday afternoon one with, with all the choir and it, it absolutely poured just, be, just before we started filming. So we, we abandoned, abandoned that. We came back early in the morning at like five o'clock in the morning. So like credit to the, to the parents and the carers, they, they didn't bat an eyelid. They brought all the kids down the next day. Um, some of the kids had sport. They had to go to work. There was all sorts of things going on, but they, they just made it happen. And I think it worked really well with the sun coming up. It's absolutely it beautiful. You just added to it. Um, and then I also, I also filmed some of the, so the actual night sky footage is, is um, basically from uh, Naranek, which is a bit further up near Surface Paradise um, and also in my backyard. So we got, we shot the actual stars coming through. So it's all, um, it's all footage that we grabbed ourselves. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you, Steve, that the sound of the kookaburra was filmed at about 4.30 or was recorded at about 4.30 in the morning when I was dropping my son off for rowing and the kookaburra started because first light was coming and he was saying to me, quick, mum, get your phone out the window, you need a kookaburra. So, you know, it's really interesting how you pull these things together. And honestly, when the song started, when I first started writing the words, all I could hear was kookaburra and kaguru and that section prior to anything else. I mean, we had Lottie's words, but it was just, the kookaburra is so significant, a totem animal for me, absolutely for, for Lan as well. So, there's, so- There's one going off in the background right now. Oh, there we go, it's meant to be. I knew it was gonna happen. <laughs> he might fly down. Speaking of backgrounds, um, you, you may have all noticed the beautiful artwork behind me and behind uh, Lan and Candace. Um, I'd now like to introduce our third songwriter and project artist, Isabella Kruger. Is Isabella there? Hello, Jingri. Hi, Isabella. Um, look, thank you so much for joining us also. I believe you're currently on country at South uh, Stradbroke Island with your grandparents. What's it like there over there today? It is a very beautiful day, a kubul day, which means beautiful um, in Yugambe language. So I've just been down to the beach this morning. Um, and yes, I love being on country. It warms my heart, really. <laughs> um, so yeah, I've really in, enjoyed being here during my break. Um, and really, I'd like to say thank you as well for getting to work with Amy B. That's really amazing for me. Um, growing up with Amy B is an institution which is ingrained in, you know, the Australian curriculum. So it's a really special opportunity to get to work with you guys. Uh, the pleasure is all ours, believe me. Um, and we know that you contributed to writing the melody for Morning Star and Evening Star, um, but you're also responsible for creating the amazing artwork that will be featured uh, throughout the project. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the, the artwork as it came together? Yeah, sure. So um, I sort of came at this from a perspective where I felt that I needed to incorporate this amazing dreaming story that I've grown up with and dreaming stories of the stars, as well as sort of the astronomical knowledges of stars and the stars that we're using um, in this story. So I sort of started off thinking, well, I have to tell a story through this medium of um, two stars communicating. And so my first thought was, wow, okay, big task. Um, so I just decided to research um, about these stars, these two stars, Sirius and Canopus. That was my go-to. I, I like to research and know what I'm doing. So I sort of started out there and mum showed me the, the dreaming stories behind these two stars. So the crow star, which is Canopus, which we are talking about is the evening star and Sirius, which is the eagle hawk star. So I sort of researched those stars to sort of get an idea first of, of how I would show stars communicating. Um, and I came across uh, Sirius being also known as the rainbow star because it, the way it scintillates and twinkles, it, it has this rainbow sort of 
appearance in the night sky and it, it brings out so much color. So for me, I thought immediately I need to look at the color bases that I'm using. And so I thought about sunset and sunrise. And of course, on the Gold Coast, we have very beautiful sunsets and sunrises. So it took me a couple of days to sort of get a palette that I was working with here. Um, and as you can see, the smaller star in the background is the evening star and the large one is the morning star. So they represent um, a sunset and a sunrise. So for me, that was where I started. I started with a color base and then I sort of thought, well, how do I show a star? We don't really see a star up close. It's a, it's a gas ball as such. So how do I show that in, in something that is meaningful to the story? So I sort of read through mum's poem um, and had a look at the motifs that ran through the poem. And there's a lot of discussion around um, different birds that we use in the poem. So of course the dreaming star, uh, sorry, the, the dreaming stories be behind the two stars involve a crow and an eagle. Um, and then of course we talk about kaguru as well. So from there, I kind of thought about the wingspan of these birds flying. And as you saw in the video, there was a beautiful um, video of the kaguru taking off and flying the kookaburra and you saw its big wingspan. So I thought, I'd like to use that motif in my art to show what the stars would look like from their dreaming stories originally. So as you can see, the, the long sort of thin lines are the, the wingspans of the birds that were used in this story, which I thought was really nice. And in the original artwork as well, and in some of the other logos, you can see it, there's big sort of circles around the, the two um, stars and that was for me that was about the scintillation and the reach of the stars and, and how far out these stars have to reach in order to communicate with each other because in the story they're talking to each other so that was about the reach of the stars and they sort of got paired back into um, they were originally lines because in a lot of indigenous artwork we see lines used as language so we see song lines for example as a straight line and so for me that was about they're communicating they're talking to each other so I, I thought I'd use lines and that initially was lines and it got paired back a little bit too as you can see the little sparks flying off the um the stars which yeah. sort of come from almost come from the yuguri the pippi which is a source of food and we collect them every time we come to North Stradbroke Island so they sort of got paired down to that, which I quite like. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, so we sort of, I worked with Paula from there after I did my artwork and we looked at how we could turn it into a logo and we combined the two stars in the logo. Um, yeah. Paula Miho, who's the, um, the graphic designer who, who has taken your design uh, and built it into, into the various different um, logos and banners and, and all of the artwork that you'll see throughout the project online and, and also on the printable parts. Um, and she's done a wonderful job as well. You, so you supplied um, the, the image to Paula. How, how did you create it in the first place? Did you use a computer or how, how did that all happen? Um, well, I did a painting to start with. Um, and then I sort of went to Paula after that and we discussed what elements of the painting were my story and what I wanted to come out in the graphic art. And from there, she sort of took that and did some amazing things with it um, on uh, Adobe Illustrator. And then from there, we kind of went back and forth for, I'd, I'd say about a month and a half of, I do like this, I don't like that. And we came to this conclusion of, of, of this artwork that you see that was, yeah, a, a meshing of our ideas um, and coming from that original dreaming story. So yeah. Absolutely incredible. Thank you so much for the work that you've done on, on that image and such a, a multi-layered, complex and interesting story behind it. There's, there's just so far to go in terms of, of understanding what you've created and how it relates to the song. So thank you and congratulations. Um, I'd now like to talk a little bit about the, the orchestral arrangement that, that we've created and, and what people will actually be playing and how, how that will all unfold. Um, uh, how, how the AMEB team took Candice Land and Isabella's song and turned it into parts for all of the instruments of the orchestra and more. This is the third time we've embarked on an online orchestra arrangement. So we've had a little practice. Um, and the challenge is to write parts that will combine in many different ways so that the participants in the online orchestra can make recordings either by themselves 
or as part of a large ensemble or a small ensemble with flexible instrumentation. We might get a string quartet, we might get a brass quintet, or a bassoon, timpani, and viola. So we write, uh, try to write orchestrations that will work with many different instrumental combinations. So at the end, we can combine them all into something really beautiful. At the beginning of the arrangement process, we were presented with a lead sheet, and, and that was the final product of Lan and Candice and Isabella's work. Um, this is the melody for the song, along with the, the lyrics, of course, and a chord chart. We then began to sketch out various aspects of the full arrangement. And because the story and lyrics are so vitally important to the project, we actually started with a sketch of a choral version of the song, which we sent through to Candace and Land to make sure that we were on the, the right track um, before producing what is called a short score, uh, which is more or less playable on piano, but with detailed ideas about the orchestral texture for each section and which instruments might feature and which might be more background at any given time. Um, there was a team of arrangers working on this, including myself, Alex Garsden and Dave Howell, both of whom are accomplished composers and arrangers in their own right and are an integral part of the AMEB publishing department. You can see some of the parts on screen right there. Um, working from the short score, we then created parts for the full orchestra, refining and shaping them until we were all happy with the complete orchestration. We're all in lockdown, of course, and so this all happened uh, by circulation, endless numbers of emails saying, what do you think of this bassoon part? What do you think of this timpani part? Uh, and, all, and all contributing all the way through, really. Um, on the website, uh, sorry, back, uh, back one moment. So, so what instruments can take part? Um, really, the, the answer is as many as possible, as many as we, we possibly can, can get to in the time. Um, on the website, in the score section, one of the first things you'll see is the lead sheet. This is basically the tune of the song with the lyrics and chord symbols underneath, as I mentioned earlier, and this is the easiest thing for solo singers to use. In addition to this, there is currently intermediate level parts for all orchestral instruments, uh, woodwind, brass, percussion and strings, and piano. Um, coming shortly, there will be parts available for all saxophones, a choral version and a harp part. We'll also be producing easy versions of most parts so that even people at the beginning of their musical journey can get involved. Uh, keep in touch via our website and Facebook and we'll let you know when these are available. One of the new aspects of this arrangement compared to the other online orchestras that have already uh, been completed is the involvement of a percussion ensemble in the second half of the piece. Uh, really inspired by that amazing drum break that Lan and, and Candice came up with in the middle of the song. The percussion ensemble is very flexible. Parts can be played on a variety of percussion instruments or on found objects, if you like. A pair of sticks, a bucket, the side of a washing machine, anything that makes a satisfying sound. Uh, this section is a heap of fun and we're excited about the energy that it brings to the piece. Um, so there are plenty of options. You can submit a solo entry, just you in front of your computer. Uh, or as part of an orchestra or any kind of ensemble. You can enter with an intermediate or easy level part and you can even simplify your part if you need to. You can play just the right hand part of the piano if you like or if there are a couple of bars in the cello part that you just can't play, you can just leave them out. We'll mix all the parts together at the end of the process and as long as you're playing in time with the click track, you'll be part of the sound of the orchestra. So how does it actually work? What do people need to do to become a member of the online orchestra? Well, first, you'll need to go to the online orchestra webpage, and we'll have the link up for that a little later. Uh, you need to download your chosen part and then download the click track. This is absolutely essential because, of course, to keep everybody in time, uh, they all need to be playing along to a click track. Then practice, practice, practice until you're happy with the way that you can play your part or sing the, your part. And then you can record the full song. Or if you'd rather work on a shorter section, there are options to record, to record either the first half or the second half. Uh, you could record both of them separately if that's a little easier than recording the full thing altogether. Once you're ready to record, you'll need to play along with the click track, as I mentioned, either by listening to it with headphones as you play or by being guided by a conductor who is listening to the click track. 
uh, in all instances, it's absolutely vital that you, you play along to the click track so that we can put all of the instruments together at the end. Um, you then record your video in any location you like. The more spectacular, the better. And in the past, we've had uh, amazing entries from people in, in wonderful landscapes on the top of huge buildings in the city, on farm equipment, a, a whole variety of, of really interesting backdrops. And then you need to send us a link to the video via the online orchestra website. Um, entries for the online orchestra open in term two uh, next year between April and July 2021. So another new aspect to AMEV's online orchestra is the uh, creation of learning resources. Um, this year we added an extra element uh, with the help of Candice and Leanne Cuss who is the regional music coordinator of the Southeast region of the Queensland Education Department. Um, so we are currently creating a set of teaching aids and resources for instrumental and classroom teachers to use when they work on this song with their students. Um, Candice, can you tell us a little bit about the work that you've done on these educational resources and what will be available? Yes, yeah, Steve, I'm really excited to talk about this. So um, my uh, everyday job is Head of Department Indigenous Education at Beeman State High School and what's really important is helping teachers embed Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander perspectives into their curriculum, uh, you know, as mandated by the Australian curriculum, in particular P to 10. So when looking at Morning Star and Evening Star, what was really important was that we were able to give teachers the resources and the guide to be able to comfortably um, talk about the Morning Star and Evening Star song line and talk about the knowledges, the Aboriginal ecological knowledge that comes along with this song. So what we've done and, and about these resources will be ready in November is um, mapped, I've worked with Leanne and we've been, been mapping and looking at the codes and what the Australian curriculum is requiring and then also looking at the resources of what we can build from the Morning Star and Evening Star. You know, of course you're going to have um, songs, uh, sorry, lead sheets and orchestral parts and things for teachers to do in the music classroom and sing it as a choir. But this is a narrative. This is a, an old dream time story. So how does that look in English? How does that look in history? How does that look in other, across the arts and in, in other regions? And also, you know, there's a part to this story that we haven't told yet. So, you know, when we looked at, when I looked at and investigated what the Morning Star and Evening Star narrative is and what it would be, I was able to discover that the Morning Star and Aboriginal Sun Legends, which really talks about the Kookaburra Kuguru, they were published in the Warwick Daily News in between the years of 1950 to 1953. And when I discussed it with my father, he said to me, well, it makes sense that um, you were able to find something about the Morning Star Mulligan in the Warwick Daily News, because that was my uncle who was actually the newspaper man and the reporter for that newspaper. So um, Uncle um, Eric Tessman, so not an Aboriginal man, but married, uh, so my grandfather's um, brother-in-law, he lived and worked in Warwick and he would visit the Gold Coast very often. He had a house, his vacation home down near the Burley Bora ground and he would see family all the time. And so he would talk to the Aboriginal people and listen to the Aboriginal legends and then he would go back and write them in the Warwick newspaper. I mean little did he know that many generations you know 70, 80 years later his great niece would be looking for those same Aboriginal story lines to be able to connect it to one story but you know we then have newspaper articles as well and narratives that have been written down and these can be looked at through the lens of English and through the lens of literature and um, in your his histories and um, geography studies as well. So we're building those resources for teachers. Wonderful. What sort of age group are we looking at? So we'll be looking at P to 10. So we're having um, a look at what's suitable for prep to two and three to four and looking at the year levels and the indicators that are in the Australian curriculum and then matching those together. And I think we're seeing an example of them now. What's really important is many teachers when they work with me, one thing they say is, it's not that I um, don't want to teach it, but it's maybe that I'm not comfortable that I have the permissions and the protocols from elders to move forward. So I've been doing that work. And like I said, there are nine elders and more that support the work of what we're doing here. So there's 
um, information about the Vimeo language region, about the acknowledgements of all the people that we've worked with and the permissions and protocols that you need to do, um, what you should do and look out for when working with this material. So this song line has its own resource and then there are teacher resources as well. Everything needed to bring this into the classroom and, and really uh, delve into the, the subject matter and, and delve into the stories and delve into the artwork. Yes, yes, that's what was needed. So exciting and, and I think it will be very useful. So the teaching resources will be available in November um, and parts will be, uh, additional parts will be added between now and November. We'll have a full choir, um, choir ensemble uh, part available. We'll have different levels of, of difficulty, but the intermediate level um, music is, is there right now for you to, to go and have a look at. Um, for anybody who's interested. Look, I think we've, we've basically uh, come to the end of our time today. Thank you so much to all of you, to all of our panel, uh, panelists, Isabella, Candice and Lan. Uh, it's been absolutely great to talk to you about this amazing, uh, amazing song and there is so much more to, to dig into. It's a pity to be um, shutting off now, I, I've got to say. Um, to finish the webinar, I'd just like to share some of the key dates for the project. Um, and if we can bring those up onto screen. So the 1st of October, which is today, is of course when we're announcing, uh, announcing the project and giving everybody a little bit of information about it. In November is when teacher, uh, teacher resources will become available. Uh, and then skipping to April next year, entries open on the 1st of April, 2021 and they'll close on the 31st of July, 2021. So you have the months between April and the end of July uh, to record your ensemble or record the individual parts. Um, we will then take all of those and uh, undertake the task of mixing it all to together and producing the, the video, which is scheduled to be uh, released in October, 2021. And we're all very much looking forward to that date. You can find all of the information you need on the Online Orchestra website, onlineorchestra.ameb.edu.au. Um, and also on the site, there will be a link to the music video of Morning Star and Evening Star, which you saw earlier. Um, of course, the downloadable parts in November, the teacher res resources, uh, and as well as guidelines on how to record your video. So the logistics of, of recording and submitting the vi video will be there also. Um, look, many thanks to everyone for attending today and for those listening later via YouTube. We hope you all enjoy getting to know Morning Star and Evening Star and introducing it to your family, students and friends. Um, thank you again, Candice, Lan, Bella, uh, for joining me today uh, and being part of the online orchestra team for 2021. I think this is an incredibly exciting project and I hope many, many people throughout the country get involved. Thank you so much.